only pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated. And, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. I'm grateful that I've had two jabs of the vaccine, and so far, my symptoms are very mild. It's far more important that everybody sticks to the same rules, and that's why I'm going to be self-isolating until the 26th of July, Monday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition, with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Monday, the 19th of July. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. England scraps social distancing rules despite soaring virus cases, putting its faith in vaccines. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson is forced to U-turn and self-isolate after his health secretary tests positive. OPEC Plus seals the deal. The cartel agrees to inject more crude into the economy, overcoming a split between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And Germany's devastating flood damage puts climate center stage in the election campaign. The country's death toll approaches 200. So let's get straight to one of our other top stories and let's focus on OPEC. Now, the group finally agreed to boost production into 2022, sending crude prices lower. It will add some 400,000 barrels a day each month from August. Now, the compromise deal actually overcomes an internal split that threatens OPEC's control of the crude market. Now, here's what the oil ministers of the UAE and Saudi Arabia had to say about the deal. UAE is a committed member of OPEC+. Plus. And we will do whatever the group decides or deemed uh, uh, reasonable to maintain the, uh, the market stability. That's what we believe that is our duty. It was important to decide this today because it gives the market uh, clear clarity. It gives the market direction. It gives the market uh, a vision of where we uh, will be heading and therefore it enabled people to understand how progressively that supply would come and how cautiously it would also well, come. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's energy reporter, Stephen Stepnitsky. Uh, Stephen, how is the market actually reacting to the news of this OPEC plus pact? This was a bit of a surprise to the market. Um, you know, you're already seeing prices fall. I think when uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia fell out, uh, um, earlier this month, I think there was expectation that August was done and dusted. There was no way that OPEC would be increasing uh, the output for August. So the market is reacting in the in the very short term uh, bearishly because, you know, more supply in the market. It's not going to be as tight as it was before, but it will still be tight. So we're not seeing a giant drop. We're seeing a moderate decline. So, Stephen, what does this actually mean for oil prices over the next year? So over the next year, you know, this actually could be somewhat bullish. So Goldman Sachs came up with a report earlier today that said that this was a mo this will be a moderate increase over the over the next year of, of supply because as economies rebound, as folks get vaccinated, the demand for oil is expected to increase, and the deficit, the supply demand deficit, is going to widen. And even though OPEC is coming back to add more into the market, it's not going to be enough to fill that gap. So as we go forward, we're going to see that gap increase. We're going to see stockpiles shrink, and it's going to be bullish as we move forward and as economies rebound. So, Stephen, what are the other factors that the market is actually monitoring? Well, I mean, it's the virus, right? It's, it's, it's Delta. Um, that's one thing that they're watching very closely. I'm here in Asia, and, you know, we're seeing, you know, uh, an outbreak in Southeast Asia. We're seeing resurgence from Japan and other countries uh, that it could curb oil demand in this region. And Asia is an enormous buyer of crude. So depending on how the virus proceeds in Asia, that could really impact how demand goes going forward. And Delta is a big unknown at the moment. Stephen, when you look at some of the things that, you know, that were supporting the shale revolution, certainly in the U.S., have the dynamics changed because of the prices? Um, you know, I, I think the, 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 when you look at what's happening with shale in the United States and what's, what's happening with prices, um, you know, a lot of shale drillers have, have definitely reduced their amount of output. And because it wasn't in the money. Now, as, as prices come back, are we going to see the shale return? You're going to see some of that come back, but a lot of folks are really stretched, and they're not going to rebound as quickly as they used to, and they're going to look back and say, hey, you know, the last time we were burned when we increased the rates, when we increased production, so there might be a chance where you're not going to see shale return as val valiantly as you had in the past um, when prices have rebounded. 
Thank you so much. Bloomberg's energy reporter there, Stephen Stepaninsky. Now, coming up, England has its big reopening as cases soar the most in the world. We'll get the latest and also talk FX reaction with CIBC's Jeremy Stretch. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Angela Merkel says there are barely words in the German language to describe the devastation from the severe floods which hit the west of the country last week. The German Chancellor was speaking as she surveyed the damage in a visit to the state of Rhineland Palatinate. At least 188 people are known to have died across the country, with scores still missing. Now, Tokyo Olympic authorities have confirmed the first COVID-19 infections for athletes inside the Olympic Village. Two South African football players, along with a team official and the head coach of the country's rugby sevens team, have tested a positive. And U.S. tennis star Coco Gauff is out of the games after announcing on Twitter that she also returned a positive test. She had not yet actually travelled to Tokyo. The American father and son team that smuggled former Nissan chairman Carlos Ghosn out of Japan are now going to prison. A Japanese court sentenced Michael Taylor to two years. His son Peter Taylor received a 20-month sentence. They pleaded guilty to aiding Ghosn's escape to Beirut. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Leanne Gerens there with the very latest first word. Now, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's plan to get the country back to normal is in disarray, with the COVID cases rising the most in the world and a public outcry over the Prime Minister's perceived attempt to dodge isolation rules after his health minister, Sajid Javid, tested positive for the virus. Well, pandemic restrictions are ending in England today, but this isn't the Freedom Day that Johnson may have wanted. Well, joining us now for more on our, is our UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, good morning to you. What exactly is changing today? I guess we no longer have any social distancing rules. Yes, legal restrictions on social contact have been lifted. The requirement to wear face masks in certain public spaces has been removed. Nightclubs are back open. And in all other venues, capacity limits have been removed. Uh, but as you say, this comes against a backdrop of rising cases in the UK, soaring the fastest in the world. And on top of that, hundreds of thousands of workers have been swept into this pandemic, forced to stay at home because of the track and trace app telling them that they've come into contact with a positive case of coronavirus. That is affecting business, it's causing travel disruption, it could even lead to uh, disruption to food supplies and it could put people off coming back to the office. Even the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer were pinged over the weekend after their colleague, the head Health Secretary Sajid Javid, tested positive for COVID on Saturday. Uh, so, you know, lots of disruption. Uh, the, the, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor had to U-turn on plans to sidestep self-isolation. This just isn't looking like the triumph triumphant moment that the government wanted Freedom Day to be. So, Lizzie, what are businesses and finance actually saying? I can't figure out whether people are really excited about Freedom Day or they're just worried about, you know, possibly being sued if somebody goes into the office, doesn't wear a mask and then catches COVID. Well, yeah, it was meant to be back to the office for England's white collar workers today. But in the city of London, you can see it's pretty quiet. It's usually really bustling at this time of the day. JP Morgan is keeping the requirement to wear face masks and a 50 percent occupancy limit. Bank of America uh, is only expecting a few hundred more staff today out of a total 4,500 in London. And other companies like Revolut have really changed their working patterns. It's announced that its uh, offices in Canary Wharf 
will be repurposed as flexible collaboration spaces. Uh, so really underscoring this shift to a hybrid model of working, which is not good news for the ecosystem of businesses around here that rely on that daily flow of commuters. And for the government to get the economic recovery back on track, it's really going to need to sharpen the test and trace app uh, and bring confidence back, get the virus under control, because reopening in the height of the summer was always going to be a gamble. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burton there with the very latest, of course, on Freedom Day. Now, let's get straight to Jeremy Stretch, head of G10 FX Strategy at Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Uh, Jeremy, as always, thank you for joining us. I mean, on this Freedom Day, I guess the question is whether there is going to be a, a huge resurgence in caseage, which would lead to more lockdown. I mean, what exactly is priced into sterling right now? Well, you're absolutely right. I think the rising tide of cases is a particular concern. And I think in, in that essence, they, uh, the uh, NHS Test and Trace app, which is increasingly causing uh, large numbers of workers to be uh, forced away from their workplace and to self-isolate, uh, is causing some consternation in particular in terms of the real economy, whether that be in terms of industrial output of auto manufacturers and so forth. So I think there are increasing degrees of uncertainty which are now being priced into sterling. And of course, not only are we seeing the economic narrative of the consumer-led recovery starting to be tested, but at the same time, we're starting to see increasing concern regarding a rising tide of uh, inflationary influences. So those two, th two factors together are conspiring to, uh, to keep sterling somewhat on the defensive. We've seen significant pairing back in sterling positioning over the course of uh, last week or two. Uh, and I think that uh, sterling negativity is probably going to uh, continue to play out. And I think it's going to make an increasingly uncomfortable uh, process for uh, the Bank of England when they come to meet to uh, deliberate on, on policy on the 5th of August. So, uh, Jeremy, in terms of uncomfortable, what exactly are you expecting from the Bank of England? Well, I think, I think the Bank of England will leave policy as it is, but I think the, the presumption had been that after Andy Haldane had left that the bank would be slightly less hawkish. But I think the comments that we saw from Ramsden in particular last week, but also Michael Saunders to an extent, I think do suggest that uh, there are MPC members are, are, who are mindful of the need to uh, consider um, a, a less expansionary bias. Uh, and I think, as, a, as I say, because of these uncertainties vis-a-vis -vis the real economy, then I think that does leave sterling looking uh, vulnerable. We're heading back towards the 200-day moving average against, against the dollar as we speak. Uh, and it does feel like in the current environment that probably further uh, sterling downside is the likely outcome as uh, uh, markets to con continue to consider the uncertainties that are going to be writ large uh, come the uh, Bank of England decision. Um, Jeremy, overall, what's the most interesting pairing for you right now? I know we saw some, we had some hawkish comment actually from a couple of central banks. I'm thinking of New Zealand. Maybe we'll get the same from Bank of Canada. Well, I think the Bank of Canada is interesting because, of course, we have seen a significant rally in the BA strip over the course of the last few sessions as uh, the Bank of uh, just sort of underlined the fact that uh, the, uh, the Bank of Canada are prepared to look through any inflationary pressures. Uh, but I think we are in a scenario where those commodity oriented currencies, I think, are still going to be pressured. Um, and I think that in particular keeps the, the Aussie and to an extent the CAD uh, somewhat on the back foot. But despite the retreat in the oil price from uh, the Norwegian perspective, uh, I think that might be one of the currencies that does prove to be a little bit of a, an anomaly. So I think it may well be the case that uh, in the shorter term, you see those commodity currencies coming under some pressure. Uh, but the Norwegian currency, in view of its uh, uh, preponderance for a move towards uh, tightening policy, I think could well be a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, and I think also the New Zealand dollar could uh, also prove to be a better beneficiary or a beneficiary of uh, uh, the current environment because of the prospect of uh, monetary tightening. So I think it's commodity currencies in general under pressure, save, save from the Noki. But I think the uh, Norwegian currency and the RBNZ uh, dynamics will uh, prove to be supportive for uh, both the Norwegian currency and the New Zealand dollar. Um, Jeremy, overall, how exciting can the ECB actually be this week? We, you know, we have the strategic review and it could already change a little bit of not only the language speak, but how they view inflation. Absolutely. I think this, this meeting has gone from a non-event to a particularly high-profile event because of the resolution of that uh, new inflation mandate, which I think came uh, somewhat earlier than both ourselves and many in the market had assumed. So there is going to be a lot of focus on uh, how Madame Lagarde phrases the message from the ECB and how she changes and adjusts that. And clearly that was referenced uh, in the interview that she uh, did with you last week. So I think that's going to be the, the, the real 
poser here. Uh, I think the, the, the strategy from Madame Lagarde is also changing because, of course, when she arrived at the ECB as a non-policymaker, I think she strived for consensus and uh, a broader sort of narrative of agreement from the other central bank governors. But I think now she's feeling a little more confident. And so I suspect we may well see a little bit more of a, or additional dissent amongst the governing council members. But clearly the ECB is set fair for a dovish outcome. And so I think that probably will keep uh, the euro somewhat on the defensive as we assume that uh, scenario playing out through the course of this week. Jeremy, thank you so much. Jeremy Stretch there, head of G10 FX strategy at Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Now, coming up, Credit Suisse is hemorrhaging talent in the Middle East amid tales of toxic work culture amid the pandemic and two scandals. Up next, today's Big Take. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to today's big take. And staff are leaving Credit Suisse's Middle East division amid allegations of a toxic culture. Current and former employees say the executive who built the regional wealth powerhouse also fostered a brutal workplace. Well, joining us now is our Swiss finance reporter, Marion Halfmeyer, who's been working, of course, on the big take. Marion, what made this environment a particularly brutal place to work? Yes, exactly, Francine. So we've all had difficult bosses to work with, but this environment in particular, it was a, it was very, there was a lot of pressure. Um, employees were given very high targets that they couldn't necessarily meet. They were given little support. <clears throat> and should they fail the targets, <clears throat> they were in an environment where they were berated or shouted at in front of all their colleagues, feeling very embarrassed. Um, so it was an extremely difficult environment to work with, and there was a lot of pressure to perform. So, Marion, what are the consequences and the risks in operating in such a manner? Exactly. So, what many of the people we spoke to for this story, my colleagues and I, um, were telling us is that this sort of environment pushed them to really want to meet those targets that felt impossible to meet. Um, and so, they were pushing sometimes the risk limits that they that they were working with with their clients, putting at risk the bank for losses as well as their clients for losses. They were also using a lot of leverage. And so you get into a situation where employees feel stuck. They want to you know, not be embarrassed at the next sales meeting when they failed to meet their targets. They don't want to be the next person who's the victim of these shoutings and beratings. And so they're pushing um, to, to sell and sell. Um, the, other, the other point about this is that the bank risks alienating clients who make losses. And then now we're seeing many employees leave who just can't tolerate it anymore. So, Marion, what is the feedback you've actually been receiving so far? Yes, yeah, so the, the story was published this morning, and we've been receiving a lot of feedback from both people we've spoken to, former employees, um, and people who I, I don't know who've been reaching out to me, um, saying, you know, they're very thankful that we've written this story and that they, they, they can basically say that they've, they've had those experiences as well. So where we're getting a lot of positive feedback, so to speak, um, in terms of the, the impact that the story is having and people are, are happy that this is finally out there and, and, and being talked about. Marion, how many people are actually leaving Credit Suisse also because of our chaos? I mean, is, is, one, is one of the biggest problems for the new chairman in charge of Credit Suisse making sure that he retains, you know, top good talent? Yeah, I mean, this is a challenge that Credit Suisse is already dealing with, right? They had this Arkegos and Greensill hit earlier this year, and they have a lot of people who are leaving because of that. And this, this sort of predates that a little bit, but is emblematic of some of the issues that the bank is facing, where they have this problematic culture um, that's fostering risks, for example, in the investment bank with Arkegos. Greensill was in the asset management, and now we're in the, in the wealth management division, particularly for the Middle East. But, you know, this is an environment that, people don't want to work in necessarily, especially now that we're looking at, you know, different ways of working, employee health. Marion, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg Swiss finance reporter, Marion Halftofmeyer, who's been, of course, working tirelessly on this story. Now, Credit Suisse denies the allegation, which it says are unfounded, false, 
and taken completely out of context. So that was after the story was published. Let's also look at what the markets are saying. So if you look at the European Stock 600, let's go straight to those and also have a look at what else is moving the market. So stocks and U.S. equity futures actually falling today. This is amid concern that elevated inflation and resurgent of the pandemic will weigh on global demand. Oil dropping after an OPEC plus supply deal. I'm also looking at the, tri the rally in treasuries. It's continuing setting 10-year yield further below 1.3 percent. We were speaking about the dollar with Jeremy Stretch. The dollar strengthening against major peers amid cautious sentiment and emerging market stocks and currencies are actually weakening. Coming up, England reopens, putting its hopes in its vaccine rollout. But what about the countries that have been left behind when it comes to jabs? We'll speak next with Alain Chibozo, chief economist at BOAD, the West African Development Bank. This is Bloomberg. England scrapped social distancing rules despite soaring virus cases, putting its faith in vaccines. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson is forced to U-turn and self-isolate after his health secretary tests positive. OPEC Plus seals a deal. The cartel agrees to inject more crude into the economy, overcoming a split between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And Germany's devastating flood damage puts climate change center stage in the election campaign. The country's death toll approaches 200. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Monday, July 19th. Now, global equities slumping lower this morning. European markets actually headed for a six-week low. At the same time, the rally in Treasuries continues, so let's get more on the markets with our Danny Berger. Danny, good to see you. Good to see you as well, Francine. And, and yeah, it's definitely a negative day in markets. Really, you can tell that what's dragging it lower is the more cyclically oriented stocks. So that's where we really get this narrative of growth concerns coming through. So if you look, Europe stock 600 down more than 1%. But the worst performing sector within that is stock 600 travel and leisure. Again, the idea here being that if there is a growing case count, it means that they're going to need to be more social restrictions, maybe less flying, less travel. So again, this is a concern about the economy. You can see S&P 500 futures also weaker this morning, but really the weak part of the U.S. future session so far is small caps. We're also 2,000 futures down than more than 1%. So again, it's anything cyclically oriented that's selling off the most. But let me quickly show you what's happening across markets in the cross asset picture, because certainly something that's contributing to this is a weaker oil price. You have OPEC plus coming towards an agreement, so you have Brent down more than than 2%. So already, if we're concerned about growth, having lower oil prices is very bad news for a lot of these companies that rely on oil, higher oil in order to turn a profit. Now, the other very striking thing in today's market in this kind of class, uh, classic textbook risk off is what's happening in the yield space. You have yields dropping lower both in your 10s and 30s, both at their lowest since February. So we're below 1.27 on the 10 and below 1.9% on the 30. I was talking to Martin Malone from Alpha Book this morning who said that this is fears of stagflation rippling through the market. The U.S. City Inflation Surprise Index is at its highest on record, and that couples with these growth concerns. And so that's how you get this picture of both a very, very uh, 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 yield compression kind of day where yields are moving lower, and at the same time, risk assets hit extremely hard, Francine. Danny, thanks so much. Uh, Danny Berger there with our cross-asset check. Now, West Africa has so far avoided the third wave of coronavirus infections sweeping across the UK and the south of the continent. But the WHO is concerned that the region's slow vaccine rollout could leave it vulnerable to another outbreak. In its most populous nation, Nigeria, fewer than two vaccine doses have been administered 
per 100 people. And though most nations are part of the international COVAX vaccine sharing scheme, only 19 countries on the continent have used more than 80% of supply doses. So what could this all mean for the recovery? Well, joining us now is Alain Chibozo. He's chief economist at the BOAD, the West African Development Bank. Thank you so much, Alain, uh, for joining us. We all remember you from Société Générale as well. Alain, when you look at uh, some of the biggest concerns right now in Western Africa, what does it mean for how investors should be looking at it. If we haven't had a third wave of COVID, could then supply of vaccinations come quickly enough? Um, vaccination is key in our region. Uh, you know that uh, we rely on exportations, we rely on imports, importations. And um, as long as we cannot have control on these pandemics, um, a business is going to be slow. And we, slow business means that um, um, development in West Africa is going to be slower than expected, mm -hmm. which means that more people are getting poor. It's just a disaster. And first of all, how do you actually, I don't know if, if it's just luck for the moment, but how do you explain the fact that there hasn't been this third wave that's been pretty deadly in other parts of the world? Because so far, um, the flows of people between our region and the rest of the world is still very, very weak. So you don't have people mixing too much. So, but mm -hmm. this is going to be changed because Europe is opening and the US is already open and Asia is opening. So things might change. And, and this is where we, we could have more, more trouble. This is why vaccine is really critical. It's crucial to get quicker and to get people vaccinated in our regions. We're still too low. Uh, Only 1% people are vaccinated. Yeah, so Anna, how quickly can it go from here? I mean, this, you know, I guess goes back to some of the rich countries giving more vaccinations uh, to the countries uh, that are in the way of development. So is there a realization that now, you know, COVAX really needs to be accelerated or is still there hesitancy? I mean, here we're talking about a, a possible booster shot in autumn. And if that happens, it means there's less vaccine doses for the rest of the world. Yes, actually, the, one of the options would be to focus on the one-shot, one-injection vaccine. Because with one shot, you can go all through the rural areas. And even in, the, in our cities, people don't have to come back. And you know that once they get one shot, it's done. And that will be, that will be very helpful. This is one of the key options we need to do now. And on, do you see more programs with the IMF involved needed in that region? Yes, we, we can see that everyone is, um, is trying to help our region. Uh, the World Bank is here, uh, IMF is here, um, the G20 countries are paying more attention to our issues. You know that um, we, all these uh, programs need to be funded and a lot of people across the world now are um, uh, mobilizing uh, to help us get out, uh, to, help out uh, to, get, to help us to get out of this situation. Yes, people are with us. We're not alone. Uh, and, uh, what are investors saying about are there still investments flowing or, you know, private direct investments into certain countries? Yes, um, we, we have a, a lot of investors um, coming in our region. What they are interested in is um, everything related to the sustainable goals. Um, you know, uh, sustainable development is now key, um, and investors are looking for any project which could help develop our countries, but in the very sustainable uh, way, and that is in interesting. Yes, they have, the, they have appetite for us. They have appetite for some project. Of course, everything related to the old fossil um, um, energy uh, economy, all this is not what we are looking for, but they are looking for everything with the new, the new trends. And I, if, if there's, you know, I, I know it's very difficult to predict what will happen in the next 11, 12 months. But if you look exactly at, you know, how quickly the vaccines are needed in that region, and then once you have the vaccines, what's needed in the 12 months after that, what would your two, three priorities be? I would say that um, once we get there, uh, priority, we have two priorities. One is food, food security. You know that um, one of the issues we still have is that we import more food than we export. 
So, so that's one thing. And the second is energy. You could see that year to day, all prices uh, have jumped something like that, plus 80% year to day. It's too much because, of course, most of our countries uh, still import energies. So, um, yes, the two priorities one is food, food safety, and second is energy, control of energy, i.e., uh, we're talking of trying to substitute the fossil energies with the new energies, with wind energy, solar, everything we can do to, to be safer in terms of energy, access to energy. I mean, does that go back to climate change? Is there a role for West Africa to, you know, be able to try and play in, in, the, West, in, in the climate change story to attract investments? Yes, yes. Um, we have two issues in our um, agriculture. One is productivity. So that's, that's uh, something clear and we need to import productivity. But two, climate change is also key uh, because um, see some areas you have too much water. Uh, some areas we, in Sahel you still have uh, not enough water. So climate change is just exacerbating this problem. So this is why, yes, it is on the top of the agenda. Thank you so much, Alan Chibuzo, their chief economist at uh, BOAD, the West African Development Bank. Now, coming up, Europe unveils its goal to cut emissions by 55% in the next nine years. But how do member states slot into the plan? We'll speak next with Italy's minister for the transition, Roberto Cingolani. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Guerin. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bill Ackman's blank check company says it will no longer proceed with a $4 billion deal for Universal Music after U.S. regulators raise concerns. The firm says the share price agreement will be transferred to Pershing Square and the group will try to find another buyer. Now, Zoom has agreed to buy five nine for four. $14.7 billion in its largest ever acquisition. The deal to add the cloud contact center software maker aims to boost Zoom's video conferencing app against stiffening competition. The all-stock deal is slated to close in the first half of 2022, subject to shareholder approval. Now, Facebook is pushing back against accusations that it is responsible for vaccine misinformation. U.S. President Joe Biden said on Friday that social media networks are, quote, killing people by allowing the spread of misinformation about coronavirus jabs. Facebook says the claims were not supported by the facts and it is not to blame for the U.S. government's missed vaccination target. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, the European Union has laid out its plan to cut carbon emissions by 55 percent over the next decade. Its ambitious Green Deal revolves around a solidified carbon market, but in an all-encompassing plan to get the continent on track to hit net zero by 2050. While more details are due to be announced in coming weeks, from tighter standards over green bonds to a controversial carbon border levy. Well, joining us now from Genova is Roberto Cingolani, Italy Minister for Ecology Transition. Minister, thank you so much for joining us today. What exactly is on top of your agenda to make sure that this gets done, gets done appropriately within time to make it to the one of the biggest leaders in Europe for climate change? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Well, the, the agenda is multifold. I, I would say uh, the first point for us is to increase substantially the, uh, the fraction of um, renewable energy in the, in the energy mix. Uh, and we need to, to speed up the transition towards uh, uh, electric mobility. Uh, we, we plan to install some 80 gigawatt of uh, power plants, uh, solar and, and wind power plants. So this will be a massive transformation of our manufacturing system and mobility system. Uh, and of course, there are the international uh, uh, commitments. I think Italy and Europe are trying to, to lead uh, this transformation, this transition. And the G20, the forthcoming G20 next, this week, uh, it's a very important meeting for, um, you know, uh, moving, moving on with the dialogue that has been interrupted during the COVID pandemic. 
Uh, Minister, do we need a, you know, a carbon tax levy actually across border to make a real difference? How much do you worry about some of the investments or some of the green bonds, you know, giving into greenwashing? Yeah, uh, that's a very that's a very important point. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Europe is, is uh, has the largest carbon market with the ETS, uh, and we're we're working a lot, and we're, we're even struggling because, as you imagine, uh, the ETS. Uh, have a large impact on the on the electricity fare for the families, on the on the cost of transportation, on the manufacturing. Um, United States are also now reintroducing uh, um, measures for uh, sort of uh, normalizing the, the the market and, and trying to uh, reduce the impact of those countries that are producing goods uh, with a lot of emission. We we need to discuss those things. I know that they are very they are very difficult. There is no unanimous consensus. And I think we need a bit, a bit more time to, to find a, a global uh, solution. I, I personally like uh, the idea of the global minimum price for the carbon dioxide emission that was uh, proposed by uh, Raghuram Arjan uh, a short time ago. But I mean, this is something that yes. will be discussed. But, Minister, one of the things, so we speak to a lot of business leaders, and actually it's usually chief executives of small or medium-sized enterprises that worry about the transition. Is there anything that the Italian government can do to alleviate some of the, you know, some of the transition pains for them? Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's a very big problem. Uh, you know, uh, everybody knows that the transition is very urgent. Uh, but everybody knows that the, the transition uh, will not be painless. Uh, th this this will require a lot of effort, economical effort, and uh, even even at behavioral level, uh, people have to change the the, the way they they, they move, the, they produce, they buy goods, and so on. Um, at the moment, we are uh, analyzing the possibility to introduce some uh, mitigating uh, rule for the cost of electricity, which is going to impact a lot on the family. Uh, life standard and, of course, on the industrial production. Uh, but, but once again, this is something that we will uh, develop over the next few years, because I think the next five years, uh, especially with the recovery plan, next generation EU measures, will be very transformative. And, and we know where to go uh, in the long term, but in the midterm, we really have to face difficulties that we still don't know exactly. Is there anything, I know the, the Italian government, for example, at the moment is giving incentives for individual houses or actually, you know, apartments as well to become more green. Are we going to see more incentives like that to try and really, I get perk up the economy whilst transitioning to green? Actually, uh, one of the one of the main producer, producers of carbon dioxide is the energy efficiency in the, in the, in the, in the residential buildings, uh, especially Italy has millions of houses that are rather old because well, the country is historical somehow. So we have a massive uh, plan for increasing the energy efficiency of the buildings, both private and public, and this will go through a mechanism of incentives. Uh, we plan to, um, to gain at least two categories in energy efficiency uh, for each building. Uh, but of course, there, will be, there should be also incentives to, to encourage people and favor people in changing cars. Uh, there is about 13 million vehicles in, in the country that are um, so-called Euro 0, Euro 1, Euro 2, so uh, highly polluting, and we should quickly uh, yeah. replace those, those cars with something uh, more modern. Minister, is Italy ready to increase its contribution towards the you know, Paris Agreement goals? Sure. That's a very important point. I think there is, there is general consensus about the fact that we have to uh, support more and more um, the developing countries and, and the more vulnerable countries, uh, because we cannot simply ask them to stop growing uh, without supporting them. I mean, that, that, that will be uh, really unfair. So um, now the extent to which this uh, financial support uh, will grow is to be established. But I can ensure that, for instance, Italy this year will increase the, the financial support for the emerging countries. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Roberto Cingolani, their Italian Minister for Ecology Transition, also uh, joining us live from my hometown of Genova. Coming up, the Chancellor Angela Merkel tours flood damaged areas in Western Germany and apologizes over a gaffe that threatens to destabilize her CDU party ahead of September's election. That story is next. This is Bloomberg.
Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix right here in London. Now, the Chancellor Angela Merkel has toured areas of western Germany that suffered devastating floods over the past week. Her visit came a day after her heir apparent, Armin Laschet, was filmed laughing while Germany's president made somber remarks about the flooding during a visit to the region. Well, Bloomberg's Patrick Donahue now joins us from Berlin. Patrick, how are the floods? First of all, good morning, but how are the floods actually redrawing the political map? Good morning. Uh, well, the floods um, have subsided uh, for one uh, this morning. Um, these communities are sort of uh, prying their way out of the situation. And what we're going to talk about next is recon reconstruction for these communities, which could last months or years. How it's redrawing the political map. Um, for one thing, climate change is set uh, quite possibly to be the central issue in the campaign uh, in the wake of this, which came as a shock to a lot of people uh, looking at uh, battered cars and and uh, villages swept away on 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 TV, and this has um, some obvious implications when you talk about parties like the Greens, who have fairly ambitious uh, uh, climate agenda. The front runner, Armin Laschet, who's part of uh, Angela Merkel's Christian Democrats, uh, could have another other problems because he's been accused of. Uh, not having such an ambitious uh, program when it comes to climate change. Uh, at this point, there's a lot of speculation, but we'll, we'll see how this shapes up over the next week, two weeks. So, uh, Patrick, is, it a ch is this a chance for the Greens? And actually, what does it mean for the CDU? Well, it could be a chance for the Greens. If you, I mean, just one example, 10 years ago, you had the Fukushima disaster in Japan. Uh, which there's a there's a way in which climate policy really plugs into German voters' consciousness, and that uh, led to a huge surge in um, uh, the Greens uh, for the Green Party in the polls. Uh, nobody's making predictions just yet, but uh, for example, uh, Armin Laschet, uh, who has, you know, if you talk to climate activists, to people in on the center left, the Greens. Uh, isn't as ambitious when it comes to climate. He could have a problem. Obviously, he had this gaffe this weekend, which in uh, electoral politics or, or campaign politics uh, didn't help him much. Um, but these things tend to fade. We'll, we'll see in the next, uh, I mean, campaign begins in earnest probably a month from now. In Germany, you have, uh, you really have a focus on the campaign for six weeks before the election. We're still 10 weeks out before the September 26th election. Uh, Patrick, where's Merkel in all of this? Well, America was in Washington when the news broke. She flew home uh, at the end of last week. She, uh, she was in the, in the devastation area yesterday for the first time. In terms of politics, she's staying out of it. She, has, uh, she hasn't uh, touched on all this, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the retail politics of the campaign. Uh, but she was, she was certainly in the area. There was, there was no way for her as chancellor not to be there. Um, and it's, it's unclear whether her appearance will help Laschet or not. She's kept her distance, um, but she's promised to, to return to the region as well. So she's played her part as, as a German chancellor should. Patrick, thank you so much. Patrick Donohue there with the very latest, of course, on Germany. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller actually joins me out of New York this week. Kaylee Lines will also be in New York. We'll look at your markets. This is a picture for Treasury. We're seeing quite a lot of movement when it comes to Treasury. So we'll look at dollar. We'll look at a cross-asset market check. This is Bloomberg. pandemic we have is among the unvaccinated and, that, and, they're, and they're killing people. I'm grateful that I've had two jabs of the vaccine and so far my symptoms are very mild. It's far more important that everybody sticks to the same rules and that's why I'm going to be self-isolating until the 26th of July, Monday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller and Keely Lines.
it's 10 a.m. in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, July 19th. Our top stories today. Boris Johnson's plane crash plan crashes into reality while the Prime Minister wants to get the UK back to normal. New coronavirus cases in the country are now higher than any place in the world. OPEC and its allies call a truce. They overcome an internal split and agree to inject more oil into the global economy. And this deal appears to have hit the wrong notes. Bill Ackman's blank check company is giving up its bid for universal music. Well, good morning, everyone. Quite a lot going on. Of course, it's uh, the so-called Freedom Day here in the UK, so we'll hear from Lizzie Burden shortly. But, Kaylee, uh, good morning to you. Happy Monday. The market is definitely focusing on this resurgence of COVID cases. They're looking at inflation, but overall, we're seeing a little bit of pressure on futures. Yeah, it's definitely a risk-off Monday to start the week, Francine. And the Asian session especially, it was really quite brutal. There was one accepted Chinese uh, exception. Chinese stocks did end the day higher. But everywhere else you look, it is red on the screen. The Nikkei was down more than 1%, as was the Hang Seng in Hong Kong, down 1.8%, really led lower by technology. The Hang Seng Tech Index down more than two full percentage points. Alibaba, Tencent, really leading those declines. And you're seeing concerns about the Delta variant showing up in the FX market as well. Your biggest underperformer amongst the Asian currencies is the South Korean won, weaker against the dollar by about seven tenths of 1%, as of course COVID cases are climbing there. The only outperformer in G10, the only currency stronger against the dollar, is the Japanese yen getting a bit of a safe haven bid. It's stronger by about three tenths, sitting at 109.74. As for the picture here in the U.S., stocks are a little more than 1% off of record highs, but it does look like those losses will be continuing today. Right now, S&P 500 futures down about three quarters of 1%. They have really been in, uh, declining further after the European open. And in the bond market, you are seeing a little bit of those growth concerns showing up with the 10 year yield now down more than three basis points. We are sitting at just 1.25%. That is the lowest level since mid February. The dollar is stronger on the day. And then of course, have to talk about uh, crude as well, Matt. WTI approaching 3% losses. Uh, this morning when it comes to futures, we are back below $70 a barrel for the first time since early June. That's, of course, after OPEC Plus uh, reached a deal finally after two weeks over the weekend. That's going to mean 400,000 barrels a day coming back onto the market, Matt. First of all, I have to say it's great to be here in so New York. It is really exciting to be on this amazing set. I mean, look at this map here. Unfortunately, all the arrows are uh, are down. All of the countries in Europe are red on my arrival and we're seeing bigger and bigger losses. 2% now down in France. The DAX is down 1.9%. The UK um, down about 2% as well. So really huge losses led by travel and leisure or travel and leisure as they would say over there because of concerns about the infections that you see even as the UK reopens COVID is really the problem driving down the stocks Europe 600 1.7% driving down stocks like Airbus the French plane maker now off more than 4% the biggest drop in three months uh, really and we see in, in terms of the biggest drop in three months the 10 year German Bund down to 37 basis points negative negative 37 basis points. It just continues to come down lower and lower and lower. Right now I see the euro dollar is down under 118 to 11769. So that's something I'm watching really closely, uh, Francine, because it's been holding up above 118 for so long. And now we're starting to see dollar strength and it's dropping, as Kaylee mentioned, only the yen higher right now against the greenback. But it really feels, I have to say, coming from Germany to here, it really feels like it's done. As Biden said um, <laughs> in that in that soundbite at the top of the show, um, the pandemic is over for the vaccinated. And I wonder if the UK is going to get that same feeling after today. Yeah, I don't know, man. Actually, there are a couple of, you know, there the number of people infected, not life threatened, threatening, but still infected after double dose is something that's getting a little bit more attention. I can't tell whether you're so excited because in New York or you're also so excited because you have a board actually and you can walk uh, through the Bloomberg <laughs> terminal bringing it alive. I think it's maybe a bit of both, Matt. You're in your element. I'm also looking at Treasuries. You know, the, this risk off sentiment is definitely bringing Treasuries uh, below the 10 year yield below 1.3 percent. Now, look at what's ahead this week today. The prime minister 
Boris Johnson is lifting COVID restrictions in the UK. President Biden meets with the King of Jordan at the White House on Tuesday. We'll get earnings report from Netflix and also UBS. And then Thursday, we get the ECB rate decision and a news conference from Christine Lagarde. Now, pandemic restrictions end in England today. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's plan to get the country back to normal is in disarray. Well, joining us now for more is our Bloomberg UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, what exactly is happening today? And is the fact that the Prime Minister is isolating the big dampener? Well, yes, yeah, so legal restrictions on social contact have been lifted. Face masks are no longer required in pub some public spaces. Nightclubs are back open. Uh, in, all, in all other venues, capacity limits have been removed. The backdrop to this, as you say, is a rising number of daily cases, the highest in the world, uh, fastest rising in the world at the moment. Um, and on top of that, hundreds of thousands of workers have been swept into this pandemic, forced to isolate at home by the government's track and trace app for coming into contact with a positive case. That's disrupting business, transport networks, potentially even food supplies, and it could put people off coming back to the office. Even the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer haven't escaped being pinged because their colleague, the Health Secretary Sajid Javid, tested positive over the weekend. Uh, so uh, yesterday they were forced to U-turn on plans to sidestep self-isolating. Freedom Day is not looking like the triumphant moment that the government had hoped it would be. All right, well, at least hopefully some things get back to normal there. Lizzie Burden talking to us about the reopening in the UK. Now let's get to oil. OPEC finally agreed to boost production into 2022, sending crude prices lower, as Kaylee was showing you earlier. The compromise deal comes, uh, or overcomes, I should say, an internal split that threatened OPEC's control of the market, sort of. I don't think anyone really felt like OPEC was going to actually fall apart. Will Kennedy certainly didn't. He is our managing editor for um, commodities and energy. Will, so, you know, the market didn't really believe OPEC was going to fall apart, but certainly there was a rift that we saw. It was very public. Um, how, how strong now is this reconciliation? I mean, they appear to have um, find a way to solve most of their problems, I think it's fair to say. And everyone got some of what they wanted uh, out of the deal for the UAE, who had felt that they were carrying a disproportionate uh, burden under the previous agreement, uh, got to raise its, uh, will get to raise its production faster than previously next year. But at the same time, Saudi Arabia gets what it wanted, which is to extend the deal until the end of 2022. So I think that uh, both countries, at least on the surface, come away fairly happy. But it's clear that the argument did reveal some fundamental differences about OPEC strategy and what the UAE wants to do with its uh, oil industry. I think that the deal probably uh, solves that for the time being, but there's no guarantee that it won't come back again at some point in the future. And, well, we saw also the baselines um, raised for production in Saudi Arabia, production in Russia, production in the UAE. So it's not just these 400,000 barrels from August, right? We're, we're already seeing hundreds of thousands of barrels, I guess, that are going to come in with the, with the new baselines. That's true, but, um, but there is... That, there are a couple of things to say about that. One, that the Saudi baseline is raised, but the, I don't think that the Saudis are in any mood to put more oil into the market, and they will probably keep their own production well below their baseline level, even when they are allowed to produce more next year. And the Russian new baseline at 11.5 million barrels of crude oil a day is far beyond what the Russian oil industry has ever produced in the post-Soviet era. Um, so there's a question mark about how how close they can actually get to that new baseline. So I think we should be careful of, about reading into the revised baselines um, future production. Um, but clearly it means a steady supply of more oil into the market over the next uh, almost year and a half. All right, thanks so much to Bloomberg's Will Kennedy. And from an OPEC deal to other deal news, Bill Ackman SPAC will not proceed with the Universal Music deal after taking on board investors' reaction to its complexity. Bloomberg's Danny Berger has the latest. And Danny, investors weren't the only issue here. There was also regulatory concerns. 
Exactly. I mean, it's kind of unclear which was the bigger issue. According to Ackman and Pershing Square, it was those SEC concerns. The concerns being whether or not it fit NICE rules for listing. And look, this was already a very unusual deal. So their SPAC, Pershing Tontine, would have acquired 10% of Universal Music Group. It's weird because usually a SPAC will acquire the entirety of a private firm, not one that's set to list in Amsterdam in September. So that raised a lot of red flags. And indeed, the price the prices even fell for the SPAC after announcing that because of some of the confusion with Ac which Ackman did acknowledge. So this deal isn't being completely thrown away. Ackman still will acquire the 10% or up to 10%, but now through his hedge fund instead. That means that Tontine, the SPAC, has 18 months to find a new deal. So the time limit now starting to tick away again. Uh, and they do say that they're going to find a conventional SPAC deal as if you know anything in the SPAC world is conventional but mm -hmm. look for an announcement to see what they're going to go after now but for now Universal Music Group that 10% holding will just now subside with the hedge fund that Ackman has. All right Bloomberg's Danny Berger thank you so much and I would note shares of Pershing Square Katanti are lower uh, in pre-market trading and as for some other stocks on the move in early hours here in the U.S. I want to begin with 5.9 and this is on a deal it has agreed to be bought uh, in an all stock deal by Zoom 14.7 billion dollars now that values it at around $200 a share based off of Zoom's closing price yesterday it's trading at 194 in pre-market trading up about 9 percent one stock moving to the downside though again is Virgin Galactic. This stock is down 38% in the last six sessions, even after Richard Branson's successful space flight this morning, down about 6.3%, maybe a little bit of selling ahead of Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin space flight tomorrow. And another stock moving to the downside I wanted to note is Carnival Cruise Lines, a judge knocking down a ruling that was going to ease pandemic restrictions on Florida cruise ships. As a result, Carnival is down about 4% in early hours, Francine. Kelly, thanks so much. Just something else to mention. Investors are worried about this troubled developer, China Evergrande Group, and it's causing a little bit of panic on Chinese stock market, which could also uh, filter through here in Europe. And that's maybe why we're seeing futures in the U.S. down. Now, coming up, we'll ask about all of this with James Bevan, CCLA Investment Management Chief Investment Officer. And then a little bit later, Stephen King, HSBC Senior Economic Advisor. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller here in New York, home with Kaylee Lines. Francine Lacroix is home in London where they're opening up. It's Freedom Day, apparently, uh, today. I'm looking, though, at earnings. No matter where I am, no matter where you are, earnings are really going to be key this week. They kicked off last week, but this week really pouring out in earnest. I've got a chart here that of course, our listeners on London DAB Digital Radio can't see, but I'll walk you through what it is. What I'm looking at is stable gross margin stocks, so companies with gross margins that don't vary a lot, uh, and how they've done over the past few months. Right now, they're really outperforming, and the reason is that the market appreciates the pricing power these companies have. We heard from ConAgra, we heard from PepsiCo about the fact that their input costs are higher, but they are passing those costs on to consumers and that this kind of inflation is here to stay. Well, let's bring in James Bevan right now from CCLA Investment Management. He's the chief investment officer there to ask him what he thinks about this. And James, I thought about uh, this chart. I found this chart because I noticed you're really focused on earnings and you may be concerned about inflation as Mr. Market seems to be. What do you think about the statements we heard from ConAgra, the statements we heard from PepsiCo, and what we should expect this week? Well, I certainly think that we will see excellent earnings numbers, but the market inevitably will say, what next? Uh, for the full year, I'm looking for $200 of earnings for the S&P 500, rising to $215 next year after taking account of the probability that Team Biden do raise corporate taxes. But it's against that backcloth and accepting that inflation is going to be high that I do think it is critically important to focus on quality. So companies, as you have identified, that are able to have some control of their input prices 
and their export prices to maintain margins, but also long-term growth, because I'm still in the camp that says that there is a greater than evens chance that inflation having accelerated this year begins to fall back next year and that extracting value for shareholders is going to become increasingly tricky. What kind of growth do you expect? I mean, we see, you know, the 10-year yield now at 125. Bunds are down at negative 37, negative 38 basis points. That doesn't really paint a pretty picture, at least from the bond market's point of view. No, Matt, you're absolutely right. Uh, I would still anticipate that fair value for the bond market is uh, a yield far in excess of where we are today. Specifically, I'm looking for an average yield in the fourth quarter of 1.8% in the 10-year area for U.S. Treasuries uh, and an NDR figure of 2%. And that's predicated on the expectation that the Open Market Committee begins to taper as early as its September meeting. Now, I accept that there are many who feel that this is way too early, but when I read what the Fed are actually saying, uh, they are saying very clearly that they will not countenance a shift in Fed funds rates until quantitative easing has been dealt with, but the U.S. economy continues to grow vigorously, and it's against that backlog. I do think that they have to follow through to an, uh, an early beginning of tapering, and as I say, I see that as early as September. James, talk to me a little bit about the BOE and actually guilt. So today in England, of course, there's a big reopening, just as cases soar the most in the world. What does that mean for possible lockdowns? And at the end of the day, what does it mean for the Bank of England? Well, here I am self-isolating at home rather than being in the office. Uh, and it is clear that there are going to remain dislocations in the marketplace. We equally had a relatively elevated consumer price index number last week uh, that came in at 2.5%, well above what the consensus were projecting, and indeed far above what the Bank of England said should be expected. I am, however, anticipating that by the middle of next year, we will begin to see inflation come down. We have absolutely not seen the peak as of yet. It is against that backlog that I think that we will see next month the Bank of England cease quantitative easing, but I don't think that they will actually shift the official rate, bank base rate, until 2023, unless there is a marked acceleration in wages. And I'm not anticipating that we will see a marked acceleration of wages. But if mm. we do, then I think that they will raise rates in the second quarter of next year. James, I just want to ask you about the value in cyclical trade. Since the peak in mid-March, the small cap Russell 2000 is down the better part of 10%, not quite in a correction. At the same time, the NASDAQ 100 is up more than 10%. And once again today, we're seeing the small caps underperforming. Do you think that small cap trade is over? I, I think that the expectation that we will see extraordinary further upward progress in general earnings in the States is over. I do have a think that there are pockets of value still remaining in Europe. In particular, I look at areas like the budget airlines. Uh, I look at EasyJet as a company whose share price remains uh, depressed, uh, where the opportunity to make money as the global economy reopens is still there. None of that is discounted by prices. Now, of course, if we wait for the good news, it'll be too late. And therefore, I would say that contrary investors will be looking at EasyJet now. Equally, the employment agencies uh, across Europe, I think, look relatively well-placed as the economies begin to reopen. And contrarians also will be looking at that area. James, thank you so much. James Bevan, their Chief Investment Officer at CCLA Investment Management. Now, coming up a little bit later today, David Costin, Goldman Sachs, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist. That's at 10 a.m. in New York. That's 3 p.m. in London. We'll ask him a thing or two about valuations and, of course, yields as well. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackman, London. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Kaylee Lines. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news and on Capitol Hill, negotiators have dropped stronger tax enforcement from that $579 billion infrastructure bill the Democrats want passed this week. Republican Senator Rob Portman says he added or the added money for the IRS is now included in the bigger budget bill that's also being considered. Portman says Republicans are still trying to figure out how to pay for the bill.
And U.S. companies in Hong Kong want reassurances from China that it will prevent any erosion of the city's business environment. That's after the Biden administration issued a warning about operating there. The president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong also told Bloomberg TV the companies hope unrestricted Internet access and the free flow of information will continue. In Germany, those devastating floods have shifted the dynamic in the country's election campaign. Images of battered cars piled up in gullies and floodwaters surging through villages have shocked German voters. That's left conservative frontrunner Armin Laschet vulnerable in his bid to replace Angela Merkel and created an opening for the Green Party, while the death toll is approaching 200. And Toyota won't air TV commercials in Japan during the Summer Olympics, and its president won't attend Friday's opening ceremonies. Concerns about holding the Games in the midst of the pandemic have been rising. Toyota is one of the Olympic sponsors. Last month, the company said it hopes that the public and athletes get a satisfactory explanation about the purpose of holding the Games. And, of course, we also had that news that one of the U.S. athletes tested positive. So we'll keep an eye on that and bring you all the latest from the Tokyo Olympics. Coming up, Stephen King, HSBC senior economic advisor. We'll talk Fed, we'll talk yields, we'll talk Freedom Day here in England. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackman in London. Matt Miller and Kay Lines in New York. I kind of have FOMO that I'm not in New York. But I know Matt will be all over the markets. It's uh, amazing. He'll also it's deep amazing. dive into New York. City. I almost forgot that it was the greatest city in the world. And I'm glad that I came back to be reminded of that. It just feels fantastic. Even 2 in the morning feels so alive <laughs> here in so New Matt, York. So, are people... I mean, I know we talk about it with Kaylee every day, but actually, you know, your perspective, are people back in the office? Because in London, so Mondays are very quiet, but I would say about 30 to you know, 40% of the city is definitely back in offices. So I spent, uh, first I spent a week on the beach here in New York, and a lot of my friends who normally are only there on the weekends were on the beach the whole week because they're working from home. I think a lot of people are enjoying remote work, mm. uh, but, but otherwise it feels kind of back to normal. The new normal is on here. Yeah, the new normal. You wonder kind of for how long it stays the new normal. Uh, Kaylee, talking about new normal, I mean, markets are actually worried about COVID, COVID cases going up, and that's filtering through through the mood, which is definitely risk off. Yeah, the Delta variant concerns, Francine, seem to be weighing on sentiment in a pretty big way this morning. We saw that start in the Asian session, and it is continuing in the European session as well as in the futures market here in the U.S. Of course, today is supposed to be a happy, positive day in the U.K. Freedom Day as coronavirus restrictions lift, but even the FTSE 100 is now down nearly two full percentage points in the European session. And here in the U.S., as the European session has grown older and the future session grows older, we are seeing the losses steepening, and it is the Russell 2000, those small caps that are underperforming down one and a half percent at this point. Uh, at the same time, we are seeing the 10 year yield down about three basis points now to the lowest level since February, 1.26 percent. And of course, the other news we got over the weekend is finally we have a deal with OPEC plus 400,000 barrels a day of oil going to be coming back onto the market next month. As a result of that, WTI down 2.3 percent, uh, or excuse me, Brent crude down 2.3 percent. We are trading below $72 a barrel. Now, of course, the other news we have to watch is related to the travel complex. You have a number of those stocks moving to the downside in early hours. First, a judge knocking down a ruling that was going to lift pandemic restrictions on Florida cruises. As a result, Carnival, Norwegian, Royal Caribbean all down around 3%, even a little bit more. Carnival down nearly 4 percentage points at this point. But really, the travel complex more broadly is under pressure as we do have those concerns about the spreading of the Delta variant. American Airlines, one example of that, it is down 3% in early hours, Matt, so it is not a great day for the travel trade. No, travel and leisure stocks are, uh, are big losers there for sure. And you can understand why, right? Because cases have climbed so much. But the thing is, it doesn't really seem to be doing much to people's long-term health, at least in terms of deaths. Here's a, a chart, uh, and for those listeners on radio, what I'll just tell you is, Daily confirmed cases in the UK, and that's what we're looking at here on, uh, on UK Freedom Day, 
have risen unbelievably, and, and there is really a big strong in the last, uh, big strong gain in the last week as well. But daily confirmed deaths are still down to almost nothing. So the question is, you know, is this pandemic over for the vaccinated, as President Biden said? Can we get back to some kind of normal, <clears throat> Francine? Yeah, and this is the million dollar question. And I think what markets are trying to figure out today is whether we go into some kind of lockdown. We've seen in other places in the world where, you know, they were optimistic that they were reopening and then they weren't quite. So that's the million dollar question that would actually move uh, not only, you know, some of the guilds here, but of course, Pound. Joining us, Stephen King, Senior Economic Advisor at HSBC. Stephen, good morning to you. So on this Freedom Day, what does it actually mean for the economy if we do go back into some sort of lockdown? Well, it's quite ironic that on Freedom Day we discover that um, uh, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak have gone into their own personal lockdowns because of the contacts they have with Sajid Javid um, at the end of last week, who, of course, is the health secretary and now has uh, COVID-19. Um, so it's a funny kind of freedom that's come through uh, over the last couple of days for the prime minister and the chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, I, I think the, the really big issue um, which Matt's just pointed to is, yes, infections in the UK have gone up significantly but uh, hospitalizations and deaths tend to respond with a lag, obviously. So we don't know as yet what is likely to happen in a few weeks' time. The optimists, of course, will quite reasonably say, well, um, the most, most of the infections are coming through for the young who haven't been fully vaccinated yet, and the young in general are less prone uh, to having bad effects coming through from COVID-19. But even the young will suffer you know, from long COVID in some cases. So this story is still sort of bubbling away. And I think it's a huge experiment that Britain is doing at the moment, and no one's quite sure as to what the outcome will be. So, Stephen, how should the Bank of England view this? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, obviously, they've had a very mixed view themselves, that some in the Bank of England have become quite worried about some of the supply constraints in the UK. Um, and this is partly associated, of course, with people being pinged through track and trace, being forced not to go to work which has led to a series of labor shortages and you know, closures of uh, companies, businesses, uh, public services of one kind or another. Uh, wage pressures are rising quite significantly, at least in the short run. Inflation has been rising quite quickly in the short run. So you can see why some of the Bank of England have become a little bit more hawkish. At the same time, Andrew Bailey himself is saying, don't worry, we can look through this. There's no particular problem here. We know that in a few months' time, all these pressures will begin to fade again and we go back to normal. That, I think, is an assumption more than a, a belief or, or an act of knowledge at this stage. Um, the reality is that um, we don't know the full effect of these supply-side shocks. Um, they appear to be more negative, perhaps, than people had originally expected. And therefore, the outcome with regard mm. to inflation, I think, is a lot less certain than would normally be the case. But are there not yet signs that those pressures are easing either in the commodity complex or even in the labor market, Stephen? Well, the hope is that those pressures will eventually ease. But um, I think we've been through so many hoops with COVID over the last 18 months, and it's proved to be incredibly unpredictable. Um, I think that you know, the natural sort of belief at the moment is that vaccines work and everything can go back to normal. What we don't know for definite at this stage is, uh, are the vaccines particularly effective or completely effective against the Delta variant, the, the Beta variant, um, and also the possibility of new mutations coming through in the months ahead that create further levels of, of uncertainty. I mean, my general point here is that yeah, central bankers uh, have to deal with uncertainty all the time, but the levels of uncertainty at the moment are unusually high, and therefore the risk of policy error is also unusually large, I would say. Uh, unusual times that we are living in, Stephen. Aside from on the monetary policy side, on the fiscal side, here in the U.S. where I'm speaking to you from, we're set for a vote in the Senate on a $579 billion infrastructure package with trillions of dollars more about to be pushed through via uh, budget reconciliation. Do you think that is overdoing it? Is that going to overheat the U.S. economy? Well, there's nothing wrong with um, public spending if it's targeted in the right areas with the right rate of return. You can perfectly reasonably say that, particularly when it comes to a sort of green transformation, uh, that's the sort of thing that is worth investing in for the very long term. Equally, of course, um, I think there is a, a risk that the combination of very loose monetary policy, uh, a huge a, a amount of, if you like, uh, stored up savings on behalf of households over the last year or so, alongside the fiscal stimulus, 
uh, could lead to um, you know, too much stimulus over the course of the next couple of years. It's striking, for example, the IMF's latest GDP forecast for the U.S. points to a higher level of activity in a couple of years' time than would have been the case in the absence of COVID-19. So clearly they're believing that this kind of stimulus is very, very powerful indeed. And again, it leads to greater uncertainties with regard to what happens with policy. Now, the Federal Reserve in particular uh, has this new average inflation targeting regime. You might say we can look through any near-term increase in inflation. But of course, you don't know in real time whether the near-term increase in inflation is, is the beginnings of a bigger problem um, or whether it's something which will fade pretty quickly thereafter. You know, we're seeing real yields now, Stephen, at less than negative 1%, which I think is pretty shocking. I mean, even the 10 years at 125 right now, bonds uh, are at negative 37 basis points. JP Morgan says that what we're seeing here implies growth of 0.5% over the next year. And that's well below everybody's forecast. What's happening in this bond market? Well, I think you be very, very careful about linking uh, real yields to the growth rate. Um, the relationship actually over a long period of time has frankly been pretty poor. Um, so I wouldn't put too much emphasis on that. But I do think it's possible that a lot of investors are buying bonds for almost like catastrophe insurance. If things go really badly wrong and the economies collapse because of COVID or something else, then have some insurance you know, put away. Buy some bonds to make sure you're protected against these kinds of circumstances. And there was certainly a case a few years back that people were doing exactly this because of a fear of another sort of global financial crisis. And in one sense, the pandemic gives you the same kind of rationale. It's the idea of saying, well, OK, equity has done very, very well, but let's keep some insurance back there just in case uh, it all goes horribly wrong. Stephen, thanks so much. Stephen King there, Senior Economic Advisor at HSBC. Now, coming up, Credit Suisse under allegations of toxic work culture as top talent exits the Middle East division. That's coming up next in today's Big Take. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, David Costin, Goldman Sachs Chief U.S. Equity Strategist. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Francine Lacqua in London. Now to today's big take. Credit Suisse is losing top talents in the Middle East and Africa division amid allegations of toxic culture. At least five top bankers and over 20 junior relationship managers in the two regions have left the firm since the start of 2019. Bloomberg's Marion Haftermeyer joins us now for more. Marion, great story. Can you just characterize what the Credit Suisse business in the Middle East has looked like under its leader and why it's problematic? So I should start with that this that this business has been phenomenally performing for Credit Suisse. It is has been Bruno Daher, who's been running the business for the last 15 years, has made it one of the most performing businesses for for Credit Suisse. However, um, what many of our, our sources, people we've spoken to who are former and current employees, who people who are familiar with the business say is that He's managed it in a way that, that they, they deem as toxic. Um, employees are under incredible pressure to meet targets that are seemingly out of reach. They feel they have little support. And what's more is when they are failing to meet some of these targets, um, they're publicly embarrassed in sales meetings and, and they feel like children being scolded. Um, and in many cases, they felt they didn't have backup in any way that they tried to complain, for example. Um, and also, they didn't necessarily see other opportunities for other jobs, and particularly in, region, in the region, people who are working in Dubai and other parts of the Middle East, um, the other problem becomes visas, is that as soon as you lose a job, you, you very quickly lose your visa and you're, you're having to uproot your family. So it's a very incredible, incredibly difficult environment to work in. Marion, how does this compare to other banks? Is there a cultural problem at Credit Suisse, or is it something that most investment banks need to deal with in the Middle East? Look, I think Historically, finance is, is sort of a fueled uh, environment, right? You know, there's this, we, we all have seen the movies and popular culture and how that characterizes finance. But we have to remember that, w that we're talking about wealth management here, which is not that intensive trading type of environment. Um, it's not something we've seen at other banks yet. 
And um, given all the other issues that Credit Suisse is, is facing with Archegos and Greensill, we certainly see this as another emblematic example of some of the risk and toxic culture that the bank might have to deal with. Right. Well, I mean, it, that's what I was kind of thinking, Marion. The idea that a boss at a bank uses expletives, I mean, that's been the case for my entire career, right? Or that he says he's got a gun to your head. Clearly, he's not really going to bring a gun into the office. If he throws the Swiss flag in the trash can and in a fit of rage, it doesn't seem that crazy. I mean, I feel like people are either being a little bit too sensitive or it could be that Credit Suisse is a train wreck, right? I mean, you've got these incredible problems there that you don't have at other banks. Is that maybe the reason that they're seeing these defections? Look, I leave it up to the viewers and the readers to make their own their own conclusions as to whether this is worse at, at other banks or, or not. But I, from what we understand from the people we spoke to, it was just sim simply something that they're no longer willing to tolerate, and it's become a difficult environment, a fear-based environment. I mean, some of the people we were speaking to were, were speaking of chest pains and psychological trauma. I mean, this, this for our understanding, goes a bit of a step further than just a boss who's angry and who swears. Um, and so... It's certainly, you know, among in light of the situation that Credit Suisse finds itself in, it's certainly something that they might want to take seriously. Marion, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Marion Halftemeyer there with some great reporting in our big take today. Now, investors' doubts over troubled developer China Evergrande Group have turned into panic. Shares are actually plunging as a creditor's successful demand to freeze some assets underscored concern over the company's ability to raise funds. Let's get straight to Rebecca Chung Wilkins, China Credit Editor for Bloomberg News, who's joining us from Hong Kong. So, first of all, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Why are investors so worried about the freezing of this bank deposit? Well, ultimately, it comes down to investor concern that Evergrande's liquidity situation is deteriorating. This is one of kind of several signs that investors have been really worried about at the firm. Um, and, you know, in particular, although, you know, the amount in question is relatively small, about $20 million, but the, the kind of broader question of whether Evergrande's relationships with banks is souring is sort of the, the kind of key issue here, because that's typically been a key source of funding for them. So a key source of funding looks like it's going to be missing for a lot of Chinese companies. I mean, how much are we talking about that's threatened in this market? For the broader Chinese Chinese dollar bond market? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a sort of key question here. It's sort of 500 billion to $800 billion uh, for, for Chinese uh, Chinese firms, um, and a majority of that, uh, a significant chunk of that at least, comes from property firms, which are some of the kind of most indebted firms in the world. So certainly a lot uh, up for grabs. Um, and, and China Evergrande, of course, it's worth mentioning, is the biggest junk bond issuer in Asia. So really what we see happening at Evergrande when concerns about Evergrande start to weigh, they do sort of tend to spill over into that high, high yield part of the market. All right, Rebecca, thanks very much for joining us. Bloomberg's Rebecca Chung Wilkins there talking about one of the most read stories of the day. Coming up, we're going to get the latest on the bipartisan infrastructure bill over at Wa in Washington, the little bill. There's a bigger bill that the Dems are going to try and push through as well. And, and that is the struggle. This is Bloomberg. If you listen to the Federal Reserve, to the Congressional Budget Office, to virtually every forecast I've seen, the inflation pressures we're seeing are related to uh, an economy that's uh, uh, turning back on with a robust recovery, uh, juiced in no small part by actions that the president has taken to get shots in arms and checks in pockets, including the child tax credit that for the first time is going out as we speak. So that's the near term. These other policies are longer term policies that take an investment versus a kind of consumption framework. We're not talking about stimulus checks. We're not talking about enhanced unemployment benefits. We're talking about investments that boost the economy's productive side and supply side, whether it's ridges, whether it's bridges or roads or airports or water pipes or whether it's uh, child care and providing a, a, a much frictionless path for uh, caretakers to get into the labor market. Those put a dampening 
pressure on anything from the price side. And so I think what's important is to help people understand that when you're talking about uh, Build Back Better, when you're talking about the infrastructure framework, mm -hmm. you're talking about measures that put downward pressure on prices the, by, by helping to increase the improve and expand the economy supply side. Well, that was Jared Bernstein, member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, speaking on Bloomberg's Balance of Power. Now, for the latest from Washington, Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern joins us now. Anne-Marie, great to speak to you. I know that it was pretty punchy words. It was a war of words from the White House when Joe Biden basically accuses Facebook of propagating misinformation about the vaccines. Yeah, that's right. And we're, we heard it, Francine, throughout the weekend as well. Senator Amy Klobuchar was on the Sunday networks talking about the fact that this is why. They also want to tighten the rules when it comes to uh, social media and what social media is able to put out there in the world. Uh, you heard it also from really both sides. There's bipartisan support in some sense about uh, the level of power some of these social media networks has. But what the president was talking about specifically was about COVID-19 and the misinformation regarding the vaccine. Vaccines. And this is, of course, as the United States has hit a plateau. Right now, the rate in Canada is faster, which had a much slower rollout when it comes to vaccinations. And you have in pockets of the country that we don't have high vaccines rates, that Delta variant is really starting to take control. You know what I think is interesting is this infrastructure bill struggle, Amory, because, you know, they want to make a bipartisan bill at the same time as the Democrats are going to say, like, look, here, let's agree on stuff, and we're going to take everything else that you don't agree on in this much, much <laughs> bigger bill, right, in reconciliation. Now the holdup is over. I guess the CBO won't agree that um, funding the IRS is going to yield more returns. It's not just that the CBO won't agree. Also, you had uh, Senator Rob Portman, Senator Bill Cassidy on the Sunday shows this weekend talking about the fact that they feel the Democrats are now taking some of those pay fors like the one in the IRS, to put forty uh, million into uh, forty billion into IRS and get a hundred billion back. They want. They are saying they're going to start using that for their own reconciliation package. And yeah, the CBO hasn't yet exactly um, dotted the i's and ticked the t's on that exact pay for proposal. What is so interesting right now is nothing has changed from Friday, but the fact that Senator Chuck Schumer does want this to go ahead, at least the preliminary start of getting these uh, plans on the floor starting Wednesday. And a lot of Republicans are saying, we do think that there is a deal in sight, at least for the bipartisan infrastructure deal. They're not touching reconciliation, but they say we just need a little bit more time and that Wednesday timeline might be very tight. Anne-Marie, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordurn, their White House correspondent. Now, I look at what else we're watching. I'm watching you hit the town in New York, Matt. I can't wait for all the <laughs> stories about what, what you've been up to, but otherwise you're also watching space. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm really psyched to be back here because... <laughs> For those who don't know, I think this is the best office that we have in the world. I mean, it's amazing. It's huge. It's bright. We have all these screens here. But um, I'm, I'm definitely watching the Bezos launch tomorrow. 9 a.m. Uh, is when we're going to see the rocket take off. And unlike, you know, um, with Virgin Galactic, this is a legit rocket. Um, they're going to go a little bit higher as well. He's going to experience weightlessness for three minutes. Like, I I'm totally pumped to watch it. So, and we're going to have full coverage, of yeah. course, on Bloomberg I Television. I feel like I also, man, I feel like I need to stick up for the London headquarters. But, y you know, it's just smaller, but just as beautiful as the New York offices. What I'm watching out for is, of course, the UK reopening today. We know that there's no social distancing, but actually it's a pretty awkward time, Matt, for the prime minister, because he's also had to self-isolate because a health minister contracted COVID. So we'll see how the next 48 hours go, and we'll see exactly the number of infections, if they, you know, match or if the hospitalization match the number of, of uh, infected, which is up to 50,000, the biggest epicenter at the moment in the world above Indonesia. Bloomberg surveillance, more is coming up ahead. This is Bloomberg.